Um, what I am going to go through is just some of the things that you should consider from an insurance perspective if you are looking at cash settling. So I'm not comparing that to other options, it's just what does cash settlement mean from an insurance perspective. And I am from IAG, so I am talking about our processes, but in general they'll be very similar for any insurers. So it's nice to, nice to see some familiar faces, it's always a good thing and a bad thing because we would hope that your claim had moved further by now. Um, but I'll go through what you might want to consider if you are looking at a cash settlement. So this is the process that we follow and as I say most insurers will follow something similar. The important thing here is that what I want to dispel is some of those myths around how cash settlement happens. So we had some questions this afternoon about whether money will just appear in your bank account. In the majority of cases no because that's a forced cash settlement and most insurers don't want to ever get to that position where they're forcing cash settlement. So cash settlement is very much about a discussion discussion and a negotiation and to do that there's a number of steps that insurers need to go through with you. So the first thing is you need to have a costed scope of works and that scope of works should cover all the damage that your property has sustained in the earthquakes. So what you'd want to do is make sure that you have the scope of works and that first you agree with the methodology that your insurer is suggesting to repair or rebuild your home. So you'd go through the methodology and make sure you agree with that and then you'd go through the costing. And there's two things that you might want to do here is you might want to get independent advice, one about the methodology, the other one about the costing. But the first thing is to have a discussion with your insurer because we, by this point, have already incurred costs on your behalf. So we will have a geotechnical engineering report, we should have a structural engineering report, we may have asbestos testing, CCTV footage of your drains, and all of that information is yours. So ask for whatever information is there on your file because then if you do want to go and get an independent assessment or view of that, you can take all of those reports without having first going and incurring costs to get those reports yourself. So that's the first thing to do is that your insurer will provide you with those assessments and they'll provide you with a calculation of the estimated cost to repair or rebuild your home and then what you would do is sit down with your insurer and discuss that, those costs. You'd then go away and discuss the settlement with independent advisors. So we always suggest that people speak firstly to their bank because if you've got a mortgage on the property, the bank will have an interest in what you do with the cash settlement. And they'll have a specific interest if it is on a rebuild, but they'll also have an interest if it's just for cosmetic damage because if you don't repair that cosmetic damage, that could still diminish the value of the property. So the bank would be interested in that. So the first thing to do before you even have the numbers, if you're considering cash settlement, is to engage with your bank. You might also want to talk to um, lawyers, to RAS, to CTAS, which is the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service, about finding accommodation if you're going to manage your own repair or rebuild, because there are allowances available, but you have to have used your allowances under your um, insurance settlement first. So you'd want to know what you need to do to um, show them that you've used that money before you can access their allowance as well. So you'd speak to them. You might also want to speak to quantity surveyors if you want to check costs and maybe engineers if you want to check the engineering. But we always advise people to go and get independent um, advice and information around your settlement. You then work with your insurer to agree the final cash settlement figure and any EQC payments that you've received and any excesses that do come off that. So if you've received $115,000 from EQC and the estimated cost to repair or rebuild your home is $515,000, then what you would be settled by your insurer would be the, the 500, did I say, minus the EQC amount, minus any excesses is what would be paid to you. And then generally, you would sign a full and final discharge with your insurer, but I'll talk about that a bit more. So that's the process. What you need to consider is that a cash settlement is based on what can be assessed and how much your insurer estimates that to be at the time they make the offer to you. So if the home is to be repaired and you've got areas of concern, then this is the time that you would want to raise those areas of concern because it is about what can be seen at that time and the estimated cost. So if you have concern about your foundations, then you might ask for some um, further investigation to be done of your foundations. If you've got concern about certain elements of 
the um, superstructure, so the walls for example, you might ask for invasive um, assessment to be done of those walls. But it's at this time that you ask for all of those things because it is based on what is assessed at the time. And it is generally a full and final payment. What that means is that once you've accepted the payment, your claim is closed with your insurer. So if there's any cost escalation or previously unidentified damage, that's not covered, which is why you want to make sure that you've got a full idea of that damage before you do settle. If you need to move out during your reinstatement, as I mentioned, you should have an alternative accommodation allowance under your policy, and that will be included as part of your cash settlement allowance. Inflation costs, as I said, if you accept a cash settlement and you go on to rebuild at a later date and price of materials and building work has changed, that inflation is not able to be claimed at a later date. Um, it's not readjusted once you have accepted. So at the moment though, we're seeing inflation of about 6% per year. So we're not seeing any type of inflation that we thought there might be five years ago. The market has kind of controlled that inflation. So once you have cash settled, some of the things that it allows you to do, and we talked this afternoon about insurers' um, rebuild and repair programs. What we did as insurers five years ago is we set up programs to manage repairs and rebuilds. And at that time, for example, we thought that a rebuild would take about 24 weeks. In reality, it's taking about 47 weeks. And the reason for that is we are now project managing completely different rebuilds of people's homes. And so most insurers have really tightened up on that process. So now if you go through an insurer rebuild or repair, they will allow you to reinstate exactly what you had, but they won't manage changes for you. And if you think about it, it makes sense. We had people who had five bedroom, big old villas, um, the children had left home, they decided that they wanted to reinstate a two bedroom high spec townhouse and we would do that. But actually the rebuild of something like that is completely different to the rebuild of what they had. And so we we're getting into project managing builds that we probably should never have been involved in. So most insurers now will say, yep, we will reinstate the damage, but we will reinstate that five bedroom villa that you had, or we will repair that, but no, we won't add your extra ensuite or the extra 20 square metres that you wanted and all of those things. So if you do want to make changes, they'll quantify the damage and cash settle that and allow you to work with your builder to make those changes. It means that you can use your own builders or, your, or contractors. So as most people know, if you've been dealing with your insurer, we all have builders that we work with. If you want to work with a builder outside of that, either you've had to end up working with a builder you didn't want to, or cash settlement is the way to do that and work with your own builder. Um, you might look at options like selling or retaining your home or land and re rebuilding at a different location. So for some people now that's becoming a, a nice option because they're getting the EQC land payment, they've got concerns about where they are, um, they're able to take the EQC land payment plus the money that they've been settled on their home, plus anything that they get as an as is, where is sale, and they're moving on to different locations. That is a real <coughs> option. Selling or retaining your home or land and buying an existing house at another location, so not having to go through that build process is quite um, a nice option for people, or reinstating your home in your own time frame. So again, with insurers um, programs, you will have seen we all have dates that we're working to with what we think is fair to continue rebuilding and repairing. What a cash settlement allows you to do is wait for children to finish school, um, wait for circumstances to change, manage that repair or rebuild in five years time and not be bound by our time frames. So as I mentioned before, we would say to get independent advice and these are some of the people that can give you that independent advice. I've got information on this that you can take away. but. I'll go through ongoing insurance and what you need to think about. So before you accept any cash settlement, you'd want to talk to your insurer about what your ongoing insurance will be, both now while you're managing your repair or rebuild, but also in the future once you have repaired or rebuilt. If you've got a broker, you should probably discuss policy cover and the offer with them. And then also speak to real estate agents. If you're looking at options like selling as is, where is, or you want to get an idea of what your options are. There's been a lot of as is, where is sales in Christchurch over the last few months, so they've got a good idea of what those properties are selling for, but they can also talk to you about options of buying other properties in other locations if that's something you want to look at. I mentioned your bank because they can advise you on their level of support for those different options, and also your lawyer to take you through the legal implications. So ongoing insurance, once you do cash settle, the, on, the insurance policy on your current house will be reviewed and probably amended as part of that settlement. And the ongoing cover depends on whether you've settled on a repair or a rebuild. 
So if you've cash settled on a rebuild, your existing cover on that house is cancelled at the time of settlement because you've been settled on the home. But as the owner of the property, you can extend your contents policy so it, that you're covered for liability for a maximum of two years. And if you have an undamaged building on the same site, then IAG will insure that building, but other insurers will probably have a similar type policy. So it's worth asking about if you're cash settling on the home, what cover can you keep on the property? And then once the rebuild is complete, to get full cover reinstated, so most insurers will offer contract works insurance or you will get that through your builder. And then once you've completed the rebuild yourself, then um, cover is reinstated once a code of compliance has been issued. But it is also important to ask about whether the terms of cover will differ. So there might be things like if you're now in an FMA area, there might be additional excesses for flood. Um, there could be other things put on the policy that are different terms from today. So again, before you cash settle, ask what those terms may be in the future. In terms of repair, so from an IAG perspective, we'll continue to insure properties that are cash settled for a repair until either the first or second renewal. It just depends on how far away that renewal is. And then in order for the policy to be renewed, we'd have to have clear evidence that there is an intention to repair the damage. So the other thing would be that your sum insured would be reduced by the amount that you've cash settled. So if your home is currently has a sum insured of $500,000 and you cash settle a $150,000 repair, your new sum insured would be $350,000. So it's just reduced by whatever the amount of the cash settlement is. And then, Again, for the cover to be reinstated on a repair, you need to make sure that that repair is being carried out in line with the scope of works, but also that you're getting sign-offs along the way. So if it's structural damage, then you would need to get engineering sign-offs both at the start to say, this is the engineering work that needs to be done. And then at the end to say, yes, the engineering and the repair was done in line with what we said needed to be done. For cosmetic damage, we'd just be looking for statements from tradespeople or receipts and photos to show that that cosmetic damage has been repaired. So it is important just throughout the repair that you are collecting information and before you start the repair that you're talking to your insurer about what you are going to need to get that cover reinstated. The council would also give advice on that because there's some things that you would want to have put against your property file. So if you go to sell it, you can show that that repair has been done and people can be confident that there's not outstanding repairs to be done. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and, and it is just another perspective, uh, whilst obviously my job, I mean if you think about the job that I have and the job that an insurer has, they have some similarities, you know, they're both about um, insurance obligations. Um, an insurer's job uh, in terms of their obligation is to look at the policy and give you uh, what you're entitled to and no more. Um, my job is to help you get what you're entitled to and no less. Unfortunately, whilst those two things in theory should meet at what you're entitled to, quite often there's a gap in between. So that's really where the differences, um, the differences arise. But to talk about cash settlements, uh, you know, a lot of people have been thrown into a bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit of panic around this, but I think it's important to just step back and ask a few questions about it. The first question to ask is, must I accept a full and final ca cash settlement? Um, and the short answer to that is no. Um, that there is, is that no policies that I have seen can an insurer say, here is how much you're entitled to, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, if the insurer wants to pay cash rather than manage a rebuild, almost all policies still require the insurer to pay everything that the rebuild or the repair might cost. But you've got to remember that's quite a different uh, question from should I talk about a full and final cash settlement? Should I accept a full and final cash settlement? Because as Renee said, there are very good reasons to do that, whether that be because what you want to do with the money is different from simple, simply repairing or reinstating, or that you want to wait and see, or you just want the flexibility uh, that a cash payment can give you. So it, it's not a reason for panic. It's, it's not always or it's not always strictly within the policy terms, but that's not a bad thing. It's another option that we've got and we're able to look at. So and the other thing to remember is that everyone's a bit different. There's no two insurance claims or homeowners that are exactly alike. So whilst you can um, swap stories, if you like, you've always got to remember that just because such and such uh, solved their insurance 
problems in one way doesn't mean that that's either the right way for you or even what you're entitled to. And just in terms of that entitlement, you do have to always look back at the policy um, and do make sure you've got a, it sounds, it sounds fundamental, but do make sure you've got a copy of a policy and that you've read it because quite often there are things in there which we kind of assume have been dealt with but in fact sometimes they're overlooked because we're all looking at the big picture and no one's done that, that detailed task. So the first thing to ask is, well, what outcome are you after? Let's first of all, where would you like to be in two, three or five years' time? And then work backwards from there and ask, well, what's the best way to go about that? And if it is by entering into a cash settlement with your insurer, well, let's make sure we uh, go down that path in a, in a useful way. Probably the first thing is, you know, well, who should I be talking to about this? And, and probably um, I, I would say it's useful to get advice earlier rather than later. Don't necessarily wait. The insurers do do a lot of work and they have engineers and quantity surveyors and all kinds of professionals crawling all over this but don't necessarily wait um, for your insurer to present you with what they think the position is. I think it's a much wiser thing to continually be communicating and understanding where the insurer is at and reviewing their information and taking advice from people, your own advisors if you think it's appropriate to do so. Now sometimes that can get expensive and I know that going to a lawyer like me is expensive and that's not right for everyone. Uh, but there are a whole lot of other services out there. We've got a representative from the Residential Advisory Service here today who gives a whole lot of really good, really valuable advice to, to a lot of people and I highly recommend their services to you. Um, but do it at an earlier rather than later stage because in doing that it's possible to shape the conversation about what's going on rather than having it entirely highly shaped by the insurer. So that's the first thing I'd say is that if, you, if you're um, still unresolved and if you're here you are, then talk to someone now and enter into that conversation and get that assistance and advice about how to open the conversation up with your insurer because there are every insurer is willing to talk about cash settlement and many insurers are essentially pressing for cash settlements now. Um, so in terms of the other things we need to think about, we, we need to think about if we, if we are going to talk about a cash settlement, what's included in that cash settlement. I talked a moment ago about the policy. Do read your policy and understand what you're entitled to. Not only in that kind of as new entitlement that you've probably heard a lot about, but also a whole lot of the other benefits that might exist under the policy terms, including accommodation allowance, including things like um, the professional fees you're a bit, you'll be entitled to, uh, including in some cases things like stress allowances, landscaping allowances, and just a whole lot of little things which, whilst you know, when we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, might not sound enormous, they, they, are, they can add up and they are certainly worth, uh, worth talking about. The other kind of thing that needs to be talked about is, is uh, the contingency allowances. You should all, if you are going to be undertaking a repair or a rebuild yourself, you do need to talk about the risks involved in it because there are risks. Risks of um, unknowns. If you're repairing a house, uh, there's going to be things that you come across which weren't uh, immediately apparent when you, the damage uh, was first scoped. Or uh, if it's a new build, there can be um, un unknowns there as well, whether it be cost increases, whether it be increased foundation costs, whatever it may be. You need to make sure that that's built into any cash settlement arrangement. The, I've seen it called a number of things. Most commonly it's called a contingency allowance. You do have to remember that once you enter into a final cash, a full and final cash settlement with your insurer, it is considered to be full and final. That is to say there is no going back. Now it is possible to enter into arrangements with your insurer which are not full and final and in, in some cases um, it's advisable. If you are going to rebuild your house and you are going to rebuild it on say TC3 land and you're not going to change the plans in any significant way then a cash settlement might not be for you because why would you take the risk when in fact then it's actually under the policy the insurer's risk. So there are situations like that where you may say to the insurer, well you can pay me cash, you can make me take cash, but you can't make it final. You must pay whatever it costs. So you need to be aware of those situations. However, 
You know, I'm not a stickler for ever, you know, you know, following the policy when it serves nobody. Uh, there will be very good reasons if you want a bigger house or a smaller house or just a different house or a house uh, or, or, or to buy a house rather than build a house. They're all good reasons to take a cash settlement and we shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to be pig-headed about that. The other thing to note is just those, those deductions that Renee was talking about. She talked about EQC deductions. The one thing I just note is land, EQC land payments. Some of you will be entitled to EQC land payments and sometimes insurers ask that they be deducted from settlement figures. Now land payments are for land damage. Uh, so the question to ask your insurer, and this is, if I may say so, this is difficult and legally unclear. Uh, so I will never agree with the insurers on that, this and they will never agree with me. But I think it's quite legitimate to ask what land damage is being remediated in your scope of works which warrants me handing over my land payment to you. Because of course the land payment exists not only in respect of the land under the house, but land around the house. And, and that may be in, in respect of uh, increased flood vulnerability, increased uh, liqui liquefaction vulnerability, or a whole lot of other kinds of land damage like spread and cracking. You need to understand what that damage is and why you should be handing money over to your insurer for it. Now, in many cases, um, there is an argument that it should some or all of it should be handed over, but in other cases, it shouldn't. It, it's a point to raise and discuss and negotiate. And I guess that's the other thing to, to note, that you know, it is a negotiation, um, and you know, I've helped many people through negotiations of this nature, and sometimes my job isn't just getting entitlements, it's also telling people, stop now, because you're not gonna get any more. And if, it, it is really important to recognise the, the choices that are before you, which may be, yes, you can keep arguing and you might squeeze a little bit more out of this, but it'll take you six months, or it'll take you a lawyer's bill, or it'll take you going to court. So just always remember what your options are and what your final objective is, which for all of us is to get past this insurance phase and get on with living our lives in one way or another, isn't it? So I guess that's just perhaps one point, not of legal advice, but a little bit of wisdom I've learned is just remember there is a time to stop arguing because what you're arguing about does not warrant the time, the energy or the money that you're going to put into that. And just, just, just remember that there are risks in cash settlements, risks like the unknowns in terms of building, the foundation costs, escalation, and also risks in undertaking your own building project. So they're the risks, <laughs> but there's also, and we can manage those risks in a legal and professional sense in some ways, um, but they'll always be there at least in a residual sense. But also there's benefits. There's the benefit of finality, not having to deal with your insurer and managing your own life, control and freedom, um, and of course the ability to just uh, have that money and wait and see and make decisions later on and not be told what you have to do next. So you know all those things uh, factor into your decisions that you'll make about you know how you're going to manage your insurance claim.